And thank you everyone for coming along. Thank you, Tim, for coming to today's office hours with Tim Sulo, who is HRF's CMO and has got over 10 years experience in digital marketing, SEO, prolific blogger and speaker. So we're very lucky to have him here for a very intimate chat with all of you today. In terms of thank format, because there's only a small group of us, so if you want to ask any questions of Tim, just you can either write in the Zoom box if you feel more comfortable or just ask on video or on mic and Tim will answer. I've got a bunch of pre-submitted ones as well that I will run through. What's, what's Tom said? Going to narrow it down to my top 30 questions. Cool. <laughs> but maybe before we get started on questions, Tim, do you want to just introduce yourself, Ahrefs, and what you actually do at Ahrefs as a starting point? That's a really tough question right from the start, what I actually do at Ahrefs, because uh, oftentimes every day I come to work, I have no idea what I'm going to do today. Yeah, Ahrefs is an SEO tool. I hope you guys know what it is and even tried using it. And we are a fairly small team. I was just saying that our entire team is about 100 people, while for comparison, our main competitor, SM Rush, is about 1,000 people. And our entire marketing department is about 20 people. Only about, I think, 15 of them are actually marketers and five more people who do design work and those kinds of things. So yeah, pretty, pretty scrappy, pretty small marketing department, but we are quite effective. And the other day we were joking that if I'm not mistaken, the quarterly marketing budget of SM Rush is the size of annual revenue of HREFs. So uh, yeah, and they're, they're not profitable for that matter. So basically they're spending so much money to kick us out of the market, but we are still holding on. So that's basically the story. And because we are pretty small, our marketing is still fairly, I would say, unstructured. We only started bringing some structure to it as we hired more people. Before that, we didn't have, I don't know, any SOP. We still don't have almost any reporting or planning or anything like that. So a lot of decisions are being made just on the spot. So that was the general intro to things that are going on in our own marketing department. That's so fascinating that you such a prolific name in the space and you operate such a small team and no reporting or anything. How do you like go about making your content decisions and how is content produced as I look like? <laughs> That's something I am going to mention in the end of my presentation on Brighton SEO, actually. Okay. But we have a bunch of, so this is actually the, the only time when we started questioning ourselves, like how, how do we make content decisions and how do we track progress is when we started hiring more people. And we had to give salary raises to those people. And we had to give those people a sense of accomplishment that their, their content, the work, the work that they're doing are bringing some value to the company. So, so far in our progress reports, what we're tracking is uh, we, we try to take a holistic look at the content that we're producing. So we definitely look at the search traffic. So if the content ranks and brings consistent search traffic, that is good. But then of course, some topics bring more customers to, to our business. Some other topics bring less customers. So we have this thing uh, called business potential, where we estimate how easy it is to pitch our product within our content. And we use a score from zero to three, where zero means that this topic cannot really uh, contain a mention of our product, like some screenshot or some use case. And three means that this topic cannot be discussed without mentioning our product. For example, uh, how to check backlinks of your competitor. There's no way to check backlinks of your competitor unless you have access to a tool like Ahrefs, to a link index. Mm. So we, when we kind of measure the value of our content, we look at the traffic, we look at the business potential. We'll also look at more vague things as virality, so leadership, because some content is not made to, to bring customers. It is made to, I know, form loyalty for your brand, position yourself as thought leaders so that people would know that you are the experts in what you're doing. So if, if you want to buy a product, you would rather go and buy it from people who know their stuff. Links is another thing because the more links your content is getting, the more those links are helping everything else on your website to rank better and bring more traffic. So like we didn't 
really develop any specific formula like search traffic multiplied by business potential plus the number of links that the content has generated blah 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 we don't have this we just try to kind of analyze where things are going plus of course quarter to quarter we're starting to look how the portfolio of each of our writer is performing from quarter to quarter how many articles they were able to write this quarter how challenging were those topics how much their search traffic was growing how those topics were aligned with the business potential with the, with the product that we need to promote and then we make kind of unscientific judgments if this person is doing a good job or has done a good job in the last quarter so these are the things that but yeah i just discussed how we assess the already published content how we plan content that's we also figured some i know methods workflows there so we have a master list of topics as i'm sure everyone does like keyword research that happens all the time and we add new new keywords new topics to that list basically anyone on our team if they have an interesting content idea they think that it might bring traffic it might bring customers they just throw it into the master list and then we kind of work in so-called sprints. I'm not sure if they are kind of conventional sprints, but basically at the beginning of the sprint, the, the content writer has to pitch. Well, I, I, I really hate actually the term content writer. I prefer to just say marketer because content writer means that all you can is write content and that's it. I think this, this is uh, not a very good way to, to describe our teammates. So yeah. A marketer has to pitch five topics from the document based on the source traffic potential, based on the business potential, based on their interest in those topics, because that's one kind of metric that I don't really see lots of people discussing. Like, how excited are you to dig into this topic, to, I don't know, interview people, to do some experiments, to produce something unique, and basically to, I don't know, to spend uh, three, four days doing research, talking to people, thinking about it, and produce something interesting on the topic. Uh, and those topics then are being pitched to our five topics. So, so they select five topics. They write in a few sentences why they're picking this topic, like and what, what kind of unique thing or unique experiment or unique take or unique angle they can bring, they, they can offer. And then our head of content, Josh, selects three of those five topics. So I think these three are the, the most interesting out of five. And then the marketer goes and basically writes articles on those three topics in any order they want. And this is the end of the sprint. One, once those three articles are written, they pitch another five ideas where they can reuse the previous two ideas from the previous sprint, which weren't selected, but they can add three new ones. So it's up to them if they want to pitch five entirely new or take two previous ones and pitch three more. And this is how we basically... And again, it's it's not very scientific because the way we estimate the search traffic potential, the way we estimate the ranking difficulty, the way we estimate the amount of resources that it would take us to write this topic, the way we estimate how align this topic it is with our business values and how well this article will, will convert are all estimations and if you uh, multiply an estimation by estimation uh you get a very vague kind of i know metric or output so the way we think about it is we basically make bets like in a casino but in a casino you don't have any information at all so you have the the wheel spinning and someone is throwing a ball and you don't know where it lands but here you have those metrics you 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 can gauge the competition you can gauge the search traffic potential you can see in your head how are you going to address the topic and make it interesting so you make bets out of i don't know 200 topics that we have in our document these are the best things that I can do in the next cycle. And oftentimes, many of our bets work out. The ones that don't, we actually, yeah, one interesting thing is that when writers pitch new topics, they also review their portfolio of topics because they can look at the articles that they have written six months ago. And if there is no signs of those articles starting to rank, they may pitch to rewrite this article. Or if there's an article that uh, landed on the second page of Google, so it kind of needs a little bit of more push to, to go to the first page, they might, and they might open this article and I don't know, four months later, they would see, oh, like, I don't think it's a good article anymore. I, I know how to rewrite it better. So they can pitch also rewrites and overhauls of the article. So yeah, we have we have a process for that. It's a little bit more detailed than I just explained, but overall, that's about it. 
Oh, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, that's a fascinating process. I, I love just how much autonomy each of the writers get. And they also, you're incorporating, refreshing as a new piece of content into that process. That's that's very cool. Yeah. And let me jump into some of the uh, other questions that people had. I guess you just answered this one, actually. It was a, the, someone was asking for tips on how to keep coming up with new and exciting blog to topics. But... Did you have anything else on that? Yeah, basically, we, we encourage everyone on our team to add to the master list of, uh, of topics. So it's not like we have a you know, head of SEO who is mm -hmm. only responsible for doing key. Like, you cannot do keyword research. I am the only person in the company who is capable of selecting lucrative keywords. No, of course not. Keyword, keyword research is not rocket science. Anyone can do this. Anyone can plug their competitor's website into Ahrefs, see what kind of topics bring uh, traffic to their competitors and think, oh, this, this article is lame and they're ranking for this keyword. I can do a much better article. So yeah, anyone in our marketing team is encouraged to offer topics that, that we should write about. It like, and yeah, keyword research is a pretty, pretty simple process. Plus you should be, I know, submerged in the industry. You should, you should be part of the industry. So for example, I always say that if I had to be a content marketer for a dental clinic, I would be a terrible content marketer. So yeah, I would probably be able to do keyword research to some extent, but I wouldn't be able to properly gauge topics and understand how like valuable those topics are for the business. I don't know, from the perspective of bringing clients, from, from the perspective of nurturing loyalty in the clients from the perspective of establishing thought leadership. I wouldn't know because I know nothing about dental stuff. So we also encourage our marketing team to be experts in what we're doing. This is why we also allow whenever they select a topic, you don't just like have a deadline. You have, I don't know, two days to finish the article about this. No, usually like take however much time you want but produce something really cool because our end goal is to, to rank. Our end, end goal is to impress people. So if you need to, to do some research, if you need to do a poll, if you need to do a survey, if you need to do an actual experiment, if you need to try things, see how they work out and then write an article, do. If you, uh, the next logical question is if we allow people to invest so much time in their articles, how do those like sprints of pitching five topics and writing through articles don't stretch onto, I don't know, six months. It's all about, again, balance. So in each sprint, you select maybe one topic that is super challenging and you're going to spend two, three weeks doing research. And you pick two easy topics that you are already, you know them well. So you can nail them maybe in a day and then go, go spend the rest of your time on something more challenging. How long is each sprint? So there's no time frame. We just, every quarter, we do performance review. And we, I think we have the minimum output of three articles per month. Okay. Something like this. So in about a week, slightly over a week, you have to finish one article. But then, like I said, you just pick different topics. And some topics you can finish in a day or two. Others will take two or three weeks. So... People are trying to balance. And then again, we don't scold them if in any given month they didn't produce an output of three articles. So we will look at it quarterly. So one quarter they can write one, one month they can write, I don't know, two, like, or one and a half articles. In the next month, they just pick some easier topics, nail them, and move on. And then at the end of the quarter, we look at their performance and the job that they've done holistically. We analyze the how challenging were the topics, how competitive were the search results, how good was the output, did they do any original ideas, how did it resonate on Twitter when they talked about it, and all, all sorts of things. Oh, I love that. I love just how much autonomy they get. Yeah. Are these all in-house writers or free, or is it a mix of in-house and freelance? Yeah, in-house, yeah. In-house, yeah. Very cool. We work with, with some freelancers, but these are, again, highly experienced people. So some of them are agency owners. Some of them have been in the industry for 10, 15 years. And they, they don't write for us regularly. So it's up to them if they want to write for us. So they pitch a topic. We approve it. Sounds cool. They write an article. They get payment. So they don't have any quotas or anything. 
So the 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 minimum output is for in-house people only who are actually our employees because freelancers are freelancers and because we work with high profile people most of the time they have some kind of business of their own which they're running so writing articles for us is not their main source of income. Yeah, got it. Okay, let's jump into some of the other questions we've got here. This is one from Tom who is also in the call here about backlinks. How should we evaluate the value of getting backlinks in 2022? It's, it's like, I would love to know the context of this question. Where, where, when and why do you need to evaluate the value of the backlinks? Good counter question. I think so, like a reductive view of SEO, let's say four or five years ago, especially if you're trying to get not so competitive traffic, write something pretty good, quite long, get some decent backlinks, probably going to rank. And I'd say in especially since the last couple of Google updates, we've definitely seen the value of backlinks decrease and more is possible with better content and internal linking and stuff like that. So I guess link building is, is always useful, but I'm trying to work out how useful it is now compared to previously. Does that like, help explain that? So it's, it's hard for me to answer this question with so-called authority. Because I'm responsible, not, not even responsible, but I work with content for HF blog, where we'll, we have been building our reputation and our backlink profile for at least seven years. I've been with the company for seven years, and then our blog also resides on the hf.com domain. So we don't have a shortage of naturally acquired backlinks. So I, I, I cannot really tell you with with 100% certainty that you can or cannot rank with backlinks. But at the same time, with quite a few topics, we struggle to rank. And after many, many discussions between our marketing teammates, many of whom are incredibly experienced in SEO, there's quite a bit of agreement that we do need to have more backlinks, more quality backlinks to our content. So we actually hired an in-house outreach person and we are now building some of the backlinks with outreach without paying to anyone and without doing link exchanges or anything like that, even though lots of people are asking for those kinds of things, obviously. And we do already see early signs that that was kind of the missing piece of the puzzle. So additional backlinks do help ours. Of course, it is, again, it is not in any way scientific because as time goes by, your content might grow. So you have to do a like, proper experiment to, to measure that. But I still do think that backlinks help a lot. I have a few friends who have their own link building agencies. And they're making millions of dollars selling backlink, which means people want to buy them, which means they work. So I do think that backlinks are still very valuable for SEO, not for big brands like we are not even a big brand, but not for established websites like ours, where we already have an audience of people who follow us. And again, we are in such a unique industry where Lots of people have their personal sites where all like all our customers have websites. So not all of them are about marketing, but lots of people from the marketing space are following us. So we, we can get lots of backlinks naturally. But for someone, for, for some other industry, again, maybe dentists or something, you would need to, to hustle to get backlinks and they would help you rank. I'm, I'm like, my personal opinion is they're still very important. Does that answer your question, Tom? 20, yeah. 29 questions left. Yeah, if anyone has questions, do just jump jump in, go ahead and ask them. Got a question about the future, actually. Are you, AI is becoming quite a buzzword. So are you considering or like integrating AI tools into Ahrefs offering? We talked about it for the almost like almost the past year mm. internally. We actually started developing our on-page tool, kind of like those Surfer SEO, Phrase, ClearScope, Market News, and many, many others. But this kind of tool doesn't align with our brand because what we're advocating is creating unique, unique quality content, not just replicating what you already see in the search results, but actually offering something unique to the world instead of creating more copycat content. And we didn't really see how this kind of tool that 
basically scrap, scrapes the top search results and rewrites them in different words, adds value. I know maybe those are big words, but adds value to this world or adds value to the internet, I know to humanity or something. So we felt that it was off brand and we froze this project for now. We 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 were, I know, maybe 20% into building this on-page tool. And we, we kept having debates like how we should go about it and not many thousands of people to uh, create lots of spammy artificial content. We couldn't figure it out, figure out how to do it. So I'm not in favor of AI generated content. I do agree that in some cases it does make sense. For example, if there is some sports event and you have to share the scores on your news website and you have to do it fast. Yeah, you can use AI and it would analyze what happened during that sport event and write a comprehensive article who scored the goal on which minute, blah, blah, blah. So you don't really need a human person for it. But for high quality journalist kind of work where you need to do research, where you need to talk to people, when you need to analyze stuff, get to the bottom of things, you, you cannot use AI. So right now, AI only can rewrite what's already there. And they don't see this as something valuable. Mm -hmm. That's a very bold decision. And going like 20% into the project and making that, making that decision. It sounds like it's a lot of value-driven decisions. I hate yeah. That's okay. What else have we got here? I mean, okay. uh, quite often in many cases, the features that we develop for HREFs are the features that our marketing department needs ourselves. Huh. And we just realized that we are not going to use this on page tool. It's not how we create. So I just explained you how we create content. And there's no way to fit this kind of thing into how we create content. So we couldn't understand like even as a marketer, like I said, I, I can only market things that I understand, that I know about, that I'm a user of, and I'm not a user of the tool. And I I, I cannot like go to Twitter, I cannot go to the conference and then I'll shill this tool and say, this is the best thing ever. While in my heart, I think that's actually crap. So, mm. yeah. I guess following on from that, so you're not, you won't be working on AI tools, but are there any features that you are working on that you're allowed to share? A cool feature that I, I'm hoping that we will release by Brian SEO, so I would be kind of able to announce it from stage plus Steve Jobs style, <laughs> is content portfolios or portfolios or URL portfolios. Basically, like I just said, every quarter we have to analyze how each of our marketers is doing, how their content portfolio on our blog is doing. And we realized that there's no easy way to just take all the articles that they have published on our blog and look at them uh, as one entity. So how, how much traffic their portfolio of articles is bringing over time? How does the growth looks? How many backlinks their uh, traffic portfolio has? What's the traffic value? Like that, that metric where we take the cost per click of keywords that those articles are ranking for and multiply it by uh, how much traffic they're getting. Because that's also an interesting metric. It shows you if other people in your industry want to buy the traffic via CPC and how much they're willing to pay. Uh, so this is uh, one of the features that we are going to release soon. Basically, you'll be able to plug into Site Explorer, not just an individual website or URL, but you would be able to create a collection of URLs or websites and look at it as a single thing. So all those graphs that we have, all those metrics that we track, you would be able to look at, to, to, to see them for a custom list of URLs. And again, this is something we need for our own marketing department to track the performance of our own team members. And that's why we think it's valuable. And that is why it, is, it would be so easier for me to market and promote this thing because I think it's cool. I think it's very useful. We are using it ourselves and we're happy if other people will start using it as well. Mm, nice. Yeah, it's a very useful tool. I think all, all content managers will find that so handy to be able to just see the performance of everyone. Very cool. Okay, question from Veronica. She was wondering, did Ahrefs experience a downturn in their traffic in 2022? Like everyone else. Actually, I see uptick of traffic in 2022, but we had the bad year, I think it was 2020, two years uh -huh. ago. I think what update it was, 
maybe authority update or something like that. So our traffic, if you if you plug Hrefs blog into Hrefs and look at our traffic trend around mm -hmm. 2020, we have like a sharp decline. Mm -hmm. And on the new overview we have at the bottom of the graph, we have those notes for Google updates. So there are two Google updates at this, at this time, one smaller one and one bigger one. I don't remember what they are exactly, but to be honest, when we were analyzing what happened to our traffic, we kind of agreed with Google actually, because we were getting a disproportional amount of search traffic and for the topics that we didn't really deserve to rank for in the first place. So we think that was a good thing on, on Google's part to re-optimize what ranks for those keywords and kick us out of the search results. But right now we're actually catching up to those previous traffic levels, but with the uh, proper topics that we do deserve to rank with. So yeah, this year it's it's only up, but back in 2020, we had our, I don't know, dark times. <laughs> dark times and then reevaluated. And yeah. do, do, any thoughts on the... Uh... Google's helpful content update. Well, I'm hoping that for us, it would be another way up actually, because like this is all we focus on to create helpful content. We're not trying to game the system in any way at all, at all. So mm -hmm. if that wouldn't propel us up, then the update is shit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I think about it. So watch what happens to each other's work. If it goes up, then update uh, is cool. Good answer. Another question that Veronica had is what are SaaS businesses missing when it comes to creating content that fuels conversions? I think the, the expertise, I think lots of SaaS companies have these classic structure where you have, I don't know, CMO, CMO has some kind of head of growth or something, head of growth hires an SEO person, SEO person does keyword research and hires writers. Mm -hmm. And those writers have no idea about some uh, sophisticated, I don't know, software that, that that they are going to sell. So they just cannot produce proper content on those topics. I think that's the biggest mistakes, mistake. Mm -hmm. And what? How, how would you say they it, tackle that? Who, who tackles what? Especially if it's like a really niche topic and it's hard to get writers that know about a product. What are your thoughts on how to yeah go about fixing that, that problem? Probably what journalists do, because they believe journalists, they specialize. There are journalists who focus on politics. There are journalists who focus on finance, even more like politics. Some are focusing on Middle West. Some are focusing on China. Some are focusing on the UK, blah, 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 blah. Some journalists are on like are experts in pharmaceutical topics. Some journalists are covering startups. Others are covering venture funding. So you have to become an expert in your field. You have to mm -hmm. specialize. And then you like, if you are responsible for marketing in, in a startup in a given field, you have to be headhunting for prominent, I know, thought leaders, people who create content in that field and basically hire them to come work for you and create content that actually has, has value and not like people who, like if you assign a topic to them, what they do is they Google it, they read the top search results, and then they write what they learned in those top, top search results and hope that they would outrank the search results from which they've learned from. That's <laughs> quite funny, actually. So people are reading content from top search results and they're hoping to outrank them with what they've learned. I don't know, that sounds wrong to me. Yeah, such a common approach. Louise has got her hands up. Go oh, yeah, I would just uh, wonder, because I know you said earlier you only really tend to work with like expert freelancers and I mean experts in their own right own owners of agencies and things like that when it comes to like assigning those content ideas or first of all do you assign them content ideas or do you ask them to kind of offer up their own ideas and the other thing I was going to ask is when it comes to the business potential that you mentioned earlier would you only really assign like articles that are slightly more towards the lower end of the business potential scale, given that like they might not necessarily be experts in use in usage of the product, for example. I just was interested to see how you work that out. So uh, 
<laughs> none of those questions have a specific answer actually as for the first one when we work with freelancers it goes both ways of course we say like do you have some interesting topic that you want to cover this is this goes back to what i mentioned previously one important consideration in creating new content is how excited are you to write about this because if we just give them random topics that we need to have covered on our blog it's not necessarily that they would create something cool because they might not be excited to run, to, to, to write about this. So yeah, we, we usually say like, do you have some, some interesting topic that you want to, to, to talk, tackle? If not, we look at what they are, I know, known for and what kind of topics they covered previously on their own blog or for other blogs. And we see, are they, are they an expert in link building or do they know how to run an SEO agency? Uh, or have they done PR? Maybe they have some interesting to say about PR. Maybe they, they can talk about more general topics. Maybe they can talk about leadership. So we basically analyzed what they were writing about to date. And again, from our mega list uh, of topics, we select something that we think they might be in a good position to, to target and we offer them. So it's both ways. Sometimes they come to us with, with cool ideas. Sometimes we have to like, offer them a few options and they would pick something that, that works for them. As for the second question, it's 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 a very good question in terms of business potential and the balance between traffic and business potential. So of course, if you are responsible for 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 the blog, for the search traffic, you want the graph you, you want to see the graph going up. But if you publish articles that get I don't know a hundred visitors per month, you won't see the, the traffic graph going up. But at the same time, you need to, like the reason why you're publishing content is to bring value to your business. You want to, to show, show people how your product will help them to achieve your goals. So we had a case when our content marketers were writing articles on very general topics, almost uh, what is... ABM, account-based account marketing. So we tackled this topic while we had an all we had an old article about broken link building that was actually ranking well, but it, it, it was last updated some four years ago. And since then we released some really killer functionality for broken link building, which wasn't featured in this article. And I was saying to the guys like, how come we write articles on topics where we barely can even mention our product while we have an article that's already performing well and it's not mentioning our latest functionality like what are we doing as content marketers like we, our job is not to just have our traffic graph going up we have to make better decisions and even go review even even if the content is ranking well but it is three years old it might not bring in you the kind of value that it can be bringing if you rewrite this and include the latest screenshots of your software, the latest use cases of your software and all that. So yeah, you have to, I believe in economics, it is called opportunity cost. You have to, you have to weigh every new content decision against anything else that you could be doing. Would you rather update some old article? that might not bring as be bringing as much traffic, but if you update it and pitch your product well, it might be bringing you customers. And the funny thing, we, we don't even track all that. So we don't know how many customers each article is getting us. We don't track us because again, if we start tracking those numbers and debating if that is true or not and what we should be doing, no, it's just common sense. We have an article that brings us, let's say we look at the Google search console and the article is bringing us 500 visits per month for broken link building. And it's not featuring our latest product updates that help people with bro broken link building. Isn't this stupid? How, how, how can we prioritize anything else than spending, I don't know, two hours to update an already existing article with a bunch of new screenshots to pitch new functionality. So that's basically it. And this is why we also removed the responsibility from for all content decisions from the head of content and moved it to each individual a person with their portfolio. Because for about a year, I was asking Josh 
please do a content audit on our blog. Please find the low hanging fruits, which topics we should, which articles we should update, which articles we should rewrite, blah, blah, blah. Where can we pitch our content more? And he wasn't doing it. He was procrastinating. He was, I will do it. I will do it. I tried doing it, but then I got distracted by something else. And then I realized we have freaking 600 articles on, on our blog. How do you keep all that in mind? And how do you kind of gauge opportunities against each other and figure out which are the, the best articles to, to work on? So this is when we moved the responsibility a level lower because each of our content marketers, their portfolio is, I don't know, for newer people, it's 10, 20 articles. For older people, it's 60 articles. This is something you can comprehend. And especially you wrote all those articles. When our head of content is looking at the content of others, you have to read every article, but you wrote all the articles that, that, that you have on our blog. So you can make much better decisions in terms of what requires attention. If you understand the goals, if you understand what we're trying to achieve, you can make amazing content decisions with your own specific portfolio. Yeah, that's so interesting. And also, yeah, it, it's just really interesting because I know I get hung up, hung up, sorry, on the numbers and also like you said about that broken link building article, we've got a lot of content that is old and is ranking. And you kind of sometimes you're like, don't want to rock the boat because you're like, oh, well, it's ranking, you know, like it's still bringing in traffic. And then you're almost scared to, even though you know it will be a better piece of content, if you just like make the changes and update it, you're like, well, why have I ruined it? <laughs> but yeah, like I, I do think it just having like a prioritizing the common sense over like getting bogged down in the numbers is such a good point. Yeah, thank you. Nice. See, Tom has narrowed down his 30 questions to three over there. So here's the first <laughs> one for you. Core web vitals, how important are they really? I have no idea. Absolutely <laughs> zero clue about core web vitals. All I know is that, <laughs> all I know is our blog in different periods of time doesn't perform really well in terms of page load speeds and all that. And still we are ranking. So I don't think that gives that much of a boost over, over your competitors. Of course, like, so I would think of it this way. If you notice that your pages are freaking slow, then you have a problem. If you don't notice it, but you measure core web vitals and you see that something is by, I don't know, 15% off, then probably it's not worth bothering to bring it from, I don't know, 85 to 97. That's that's my take, but I'm not a technical SEO. I'm not working with like hundreds of clients optimizing their website. So I'm speaking just from my own experience. Yeah, we, we had the same experience where we had like a super difficult keyword and I was freaking out because the core web title score was like, your page is trash. And then it was for electronic signature and we were ranking the, like number two between DocuSign and Adobe Sign. I was like, I think the page is good. I think Google likes it. So I think, I think it might be like, maybe there's going to be a future update that's really harsh with core web title. I think, I think uh, it was a bit of- you just, you just mentioned a few brands. I actually think brand affinity can play a role here because if, if people just know, I, I'm using DocSign, for example. So if I would search for something like this and saw a link from them ranking, I would click it. I, I wouldn't bother clicking anything else. So what, what might be happening here is just brand affinity. People are clicking on the brands they, they know best. That's a guess. Cool. Yeah, I think Second question from Tom. 20% of headcount being in marketing is big. Can you share how that number changed over time versus total headcount growth, et cetera, since you joined? So when I joined, we had 16 people. So I was number 16 in the team and I was the, the only marketer at the time, not the first marketer in the company, but the only marketer at the time. My predecessor didn't last long, it seems. So how they changed over time, it actually changed very gradually. Coming from Ukraine, I was super scrappy with spending any budget at all, because I will tell you a story to, to better understand how I was hired. So it was like over seven years ago. I got an email from Dmitry, the founder and CEO of Hrefs, 
And he was asking, like, he, he saw some of my guest articles online. I had some guest guest posts on Moz blog and such. And he emailed me saying, do you want to do some work for HRS? Maybe write an article. We need to promote our new tool called Content Explorer. I said, yeah, sure. But I was working on some of my own projects and I was like, okay, I need to give him a price at which like he would just say, no, I'm not going to pay you this. And I would be okay. But if he would pay me, I will work on it. So I, I don't want to price myself too cheap. And the price I gave him, $150 for an article. So that was, that was the situation I was in before joining HRF. So I said like $150. He was like, yeah, okay. I was shit, something is wrong. Uh, something is, is not right here. So basically when I joined, joined HRFs, I inherited a bunch of freelancers. I don't know, from India or Pakistan or whatever. And they're writing super shitty articles, like those 300, 500 words articles about nothing, basically, but quite consistently, like two per week or something. And when I checked how much we were paying them, it was like 300 euros per article. So I asked for $150 to kind of price myself out. And I was hoping that Dmitry would say, no, like it's too expensive. And I was okay, then I will keep working on my own projects. And we were paying for some shitty content to some, I don't know who they are. I still haven't seen them ever since. 300 euros. So yeah, you can tell I was super scrappy with spending any money on anything. I was doing lots of stuff on my own. I, I think in the first year I didn't spend any money at all and only... Maybe in the second year, I started hiring writers slowly. I think Josh was, uh, who is our head of content right now, was the, the first hire. And they, even with him, I couldn't kind of take the responsibility of hiring a full-time person and kind of being responsible for their success. And like, so we were paying them this kind of salary. So they have to be bringing this kind of value. I was afraid to, to make this kind of decision. So for quite a long time, we just worked in a freelancer relationship where we paid him per article. And we paid also quite a moderate fee. Actually about, I know, I think we, we also maybe started from about $300 and something. And then it kept growing as I was demanding more and more effort to, to be put into the article. So yeah, Josh was probably the first hire. Uh, we also tried working with a bunch of freelancers to, to get to publish content on our blog, it, it didn't really work well. So I think out of seven years that I have been with HREFs, for the first four years, our marketing team was under five. It's only exploded in the past two years. And one of the reasons why it exploded is because STMrush went for IPO and they started basically burning the market like buying all the ads, buying all the influencers. I had some people, some quite notable names in the SEO industry come to me and say, SM Russia are offering me 70%, 7-0, 70 70% commission to swap my links from HRS to SM Rush. And the guy said, no. Another person, also quite a prominent person in the SEO industry said that SM Russia is reaching out to me. They want to form a board of advisors they're offering me shares to be on their advisory board. They weren't saying literally like, stop talking about HRF, stop promoting them. We'll give you shares of SM Rush and like uh, once a month we'll connect our call and you'll give us advice. But that was basically the premise. So yeah, the, the, the reason why we started growing our own team and hiring more writers and expanding and hiring, I know a PR person, hiring a link builder, expanding our operations with video content only because we, we feel pressure from SMRush. They're, they're throwing so much money into marketing that we couldn't just stay scrappy. Plus they are following our footsteps. They are copying our blog content strategy because see, if you analyze what they were doing, I don't know, five years ago and what they're doing right now on their blog, it's so similar to what we're doing. The article structure, the images. So they even tried to poach Sam, the guy who who does our YouTube videos. They, they literally, the VP of marketing at SM Rush reached out to him on LinkedIn and said, oh, like we need some consulting, blah, blah, blah. Maybe you want so you also want to join SM Rush. So they're incredibly aggressive. And that's the main reason why we started expanding our own team. So yeah, just, just two years ago, we started hiring more people. Oh, yeah. So you can relate. <laughs> yeah, but... Thankfully, like they're all terrible at content. So, like, I mean, they're not, they're not all terrible, but money can't buy you like better content, is what I've learned. Well, they bought Backlinko. 
So money can buy you quite a bit of stuff, actually. Enough money, yeah. I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they are they are like exorbitant amounts of money they're spending on their marketing. Absolutely. Like the other day, I saw a Twitter thread from one of their marketers, Olga. She was talking about how they started doing content on TikTok. And I'm reading maybe the third tweet in the thread. And she said, so then we decided to hire stand-up comedians to create like funny scripts for us. And I was, oh shit, I'm not reading that. Like who spends so much money to hire stand-up comedians to do scripts for your freaking TikTok? No, like it's like, how can it's, how it's, can someone on Twitter re relate to that? Like, will you go to your boss and say, we just need to hire stand-up comedians and we will be good. We'll be good. It's a good time to be a stand-up comedian because like Netflix will give you a hundred million because they just want to own all of that. And then S uh, Sam Rush will give you the rest. Should have gone into stand-up comedy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, we've got four minutes to answer Tom's final question before we wrap up, which is your product update blogs are really the best ones I've seen. How do you make them happen? I.e. coordinate all the people and the timing, create the videos, who owns it, what's the lead time, etc. Great question. It's not that many people that are asking us questions like this. So there is a kind of process for it, but it's not entirely formalized as of right now. So I can kind of walk you through what happens. Just, just to make sure no one is working at SMRush on this call, right? Sophia, Luis, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So we have a channel called Updates on Slack, where the, the product team and developers are responsible for posting whatever, whenever some, some new feature is being rolled out. They post in the channel and we know that something new has appeared in Ahrefs. So I've read a book by Intercom about how they plan their product updates, where the marketing teams know, knows, I don't know, three months in advance that on this date uh, they're launching a feature. We don't bother about this. We can announce the feature in three weeks after it was released and like people started using it already. We don't care. We figured that we just don't care. So I see, I personally see that some feature was released. Sometimes even I'm I'm the, the person who requested this feature in the first place, who, who offered to build it. But anyway, the, the way I know that something was released is this channel. So then I have a spreadsheet where we have rows with the new feature releases. And columns basically with all the places where we announce them. So we have like dashboard banner, we have Twitter, we have LinkedIn, we have our Facebook community, we have my Twitter account. So all the places where we can announce the feature. Again, next to Twitter, we have a column for Twitter ads. Next to Facebook, we have a column for Facebook ads. So then I take the new feature update. I post it in that spreadsheet. And then I'm responsible for some columns, some other person responsible for other columns. So we have the spreadsheet where we're tracking all the feature updates. Plus I'm usually the, the first one who announces the update on Facebook. And usually that sets kind of the tone and the angle of how this feature is being presented. So I myself, and sometimes I like, because I'm not an all-knowing SEO person, especially when it comes to technical SEO, like I just said, core web vitals have no idea. Sometimes I would ask some of my more experienced colleagues, like, how is this useful? Can you, can, can you give me a use case? Can you walk me through it? So then I post my understanding of the feature on Facebook. And I add link to the document. Then we have our social media person. She sees how I announce the feature. She repurposes this into a tweet. She repurposes it. And, they, and again, she watches like what people are replying on Facebook. We watch what people are replying on Twitter. We, we see the discussions in Slack if someone is asking some, some questions about this feature. So then after a while, we have another lady who at the end of each month, collects all the feature updates that were announced and were listed in this document. And she already has like my copy, how I pitched it. She already saw, and on Twitter, we also do a few attempts to tweet it. So if for our community, I have just one attempt to announce it on Twitter, we try to approach the feature from different angles. We can post it with a screenshot. We can post it with a screencast. We can, I don't know, ask a question about it or something. So this kind of generates quite a bit of information about certain functionality. So then this person goes and rewrites all those feature updates into an article. And then this article gets repurposed into a video. And for the video, we already have a pretty streamlined process where that person has to record themselves on camera and then send it to people who are responsible for adding all those animations, music, blah, blah, blah. And it gets published on YouTube. So that process is pretty smooth. That's how more or less it works. 
That's awesome. Thanks so much. Like someone just put that problem on my desk the other day and said, can we do this? <laughs> so it's really good to know how it will break down. I can't tell you how useful that is. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you so much for that in detail process walkthrough. Amazing. And thank you for giving up your evening today. I know it must be 9 p.m. in Singapore. So thank you so much for spending your time with us. Really sure. appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was really it was great and hopefully we'll see and you around brighton seo i think most of us are going yeah home. now now you'll have to cheer for me while while i'll be on stage i should be hearing screams oh this is team <laughs> we will we'll have our t-shirts on as well what's your topic talk what's the title content marketing our way perfect i will definitely okay. be there <laughs> thank you so much i'll see you there Lauren. see you there bye, thanks, bye. bye guys bye.